Know your GDPR with independent.ie, powered by Magnet Networks. Hello and welcome to this special Know Your GDPR podcast series with me, Brian Honan. On this first episode, we'll be finding out what exactly GDPR is, why it's been introduced, and what it means for your business. To take us through the ins and outs of it all, I'm joined by two of the country's foremost GDPR experts. Emerald DeLeo from EuroComply. And Dara O'Brien from Castlebridge. So, Dara, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that we're all intrigued about and that we're hearing so much about at the moment. For those people listening to this podcast who haven't heard about it or looked at it yet, what is the GDPR and why should they care? GDPR stands for Good Data Processes Really. (laughs) <laughs> and that's what the focus is on. Uh, it's an update to the data privacy laws we've had in Europe for the last 30 years. So the core principles are broadly unchanged. If you've been doing things well under the current legislation, you'll be reasonably okay under GDPR. If you've been hiding under a rock trying to pretend there is no such thing as data protection law, you have a huge mountain to climb. But it's doable. At the core of GDPR, there are a number of core basic principles for data privacy, including uh, lawfulness, fairness, transparency. So you need to tell people what you're going to do with their data. You need to make sure you've got a clear basis for what, why you're using their data, either contract, uh, your legitimate interest if you're a private sector organization, uh, or statutory basis if you're a public sector organization. There's a list of them. Uh, You need to be clear about what data you need for the purposes you have. So you only ask for the minimum you need. And if you're asking for a lot, you need to be able to justify why you're asking for it. Uh, You need to keep it for no longer than you need to have it for the the purpose you got it for in the first place. Storage limitation, which we used to call data retention. But I I, I always tell people this is one of the relabelings in GDPR. I say data retention. That's like asking you not to think of an elephant. So when I say data retention, you start thinking about how much data can we keep? What do we need to hold on to just in case? Storage limitation changes the dynamic you're thinking that you only have one filing cabinet it only has four drawers what do you need to keep accuracy is a principle uh, integrity and confidentiality is another principle again this going back to, to your core world brian and information security it reminds us why we're doing security why do you have a clean desk policy so that people can't walk past your desk and see the stuff that's on the table why do we make sure we don't share our passwords with our peers so we can make sure people can't log in and change data so we can trust the data and that's not being shared or accessed without authorization one of the key changes in gdpr though is the accountability principle this is a shift where we're looking internally into the organization now rather than Uh, an external focus on a regulator. And we're saying, what have we got internally in the organization in terms of our governance structures, in terms of documentation, in terms of understanding how we're handling data so that we know what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, who's doing it. And if something goes wrong, who is the person who has to step in and take action internally to make sure the issue is controlled and managed and mitigated. And ultimately, it's about trust. We're in the trust business and accountability is the foundation for trust. So, Emerald, thanks to Dara's explanation there of GDPR, those business owners out there are are now aware of GDPR. So, what next steps should they be looking at? Okay, so Dara obviously outlined a lot of the core principles of GDPR. And one of the most important one-liners I can give you is that everything you do actually needs to be auditable. So that means that you need to have documentation in place to make sure that you can actually prove your efforts. There's no point... Yes, this is the accountability principle, but also closely aligns to this principle of transparency. Um, You need to be really clear um, as regards how you're processing data, why you're processing data, and you need to tell people what you're doing. And a lot of this GDPR stuff that people are talking about, a lot of it is common sense. Generally, if it feels wrong, it tends to be wrong. And I suppose... If somebody can't reasonably expect for their information to be processed in a certain way, then that is probably not the best way forward. So it's really important to sit down and there's a lot of ethics involved in data protection as well and sit down with your team and say, you know, can we really justify what we're doing? Now, in order to align to the various principles, you need to look at all of your processes, see why you're doing certain things, what your lawful basis is, um, how you can prove that you can rely on that, and then build documentation around this. Because the way it used to be was as an organization, in many cases, you'd have to register with the data protection authorities. So that's with Helen Dix's office in Ireland. That is largely gone now. Instead, you have to prove what you're doing. And if you can't do that, and if you haven't done anything so far, 
you'll want to get cracking pretty soon. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I keep using the example of John F. Kennedy's speech to the U.S. Congress in 1961 looking for the funding for the Apollo program. It's this nation's stated objective, by the end of the decade, we'll land a man safely on the moon and return them safely to the Earth again. That was on the 25th of May, 1961. 25th of May, 2018, you have to be able to document, you have to be able to be compliant with the core principles of GDPR and be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of your controls for compliance. So it's a John F. Kennedy-style comma in the middle of that sentence. So, so you just mentioned the space program there and a very ambitious uh, goal by JFK back in 1961. Lots of people listening to this now are probably going, being compliant by May 25th is equally as ambitious. And But they're also probably saying, well, I'm a small company or my company doesn't do X, Y, and Z or, you know, we don't, we're not a, a bank, we're not a large retailer, we're not a social network. So I really don't have to worry about this. It doesn't apply to me. Is but that, that's not how it works because personal data, you know, it's it's binary. It is or it isn't. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, when somebody asks me, um, so the GDPR probably doesn't apply to me, right? Because we're only B2B. And then you just say, you know, well, first of all, people that work in companies are also people. So you're processing their data. And then you ask them, do you have employees? And then they go, Yeah. Then you say, do you have a website? Do you have a contact form on there? And they answered that with a yes. All of this is personal information. And it's really important to... That's changed with GDPR from previous data protection is that business contact information comes under the remit now much more so than previously. It's it's, it's clarified in GDPR. It was was always the case that the, the, the identifiable contact person in a business, if you were being prudent and responsible, you would treat that as a as personal data in the same way. And again, employees are people too, which might be news to some people, but unfortunately <laughs> yeah, exactly. they are. Uh, or fortunately well, they are. I like the way did, you know, made the distinction, people that work in employees. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that a big part of the questions that keep happening, and it's generally one of the first questions that any data privacy person gets, and I'm sure that Darrow backed me up on this, is can we keep marketing to people? And do we have to delete our entire database now? And this, this opt-in, opt-out, double opt-in, all of that... All of this is kind of old because the e-privacy directive was always there. And I'm kind and of... And that, just for clarification, the e-privacy directive is separate to... GDPR. GDPR. And they both the, apply. But they are related and they, they, they both apply. Yeah, yeah, so e-privacy is the electronic communications directive. And it basically gives you a set of rules for various ways of marketing to people. And it causes tremendous confusion. And it's quite strange that people treat it as something that's new because it's been around for a while, as is data protection as a whole. We've had a data protection directive that dates back to 1995. So as Dara outlined saying, you know, if you haven't done anything before, you probably should have. Now, it doesn't mean that the world is going to end on May 25th. That's an interesting point. And Dara, I just want to ask you this one. Uh, Aaron mentioned there, and you mentioned, in your introduction as well about if you've been doing data protection properly. But if you haven't been doing data protection properly, so if you haven't cared about data protection or you haven't given it the importance it deserves, why should you give GDPR the same level of importance? Like what's 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 so different about GDPR than the existing data protection? Okay, what's, well, what's the worst thing can happen to me? Okay, so first thing, GDPR is a risk-based model, which is an important point to make. So you, are, you will be making decisions and you need to record your decisions and your, your rationale and your reasoning and having that paperwork, as Emerald said, is important. The wor- absolute worst case scenario you can get hit with under GDPR is those 4% of turnover fines. Um, that's the headline. But if you peel back the enforcement powers that are available to the Data Protection Commission under current Data Protection Acts and with the, the, the enforcement powers which were strengthened under GDPR, you can be told to stop doing what you're yeah, doing. And I, and I, sorry to interrupt you there, Dara, but I think this is a very important point because yeah. I've seen you speak about this at previous conferences. And we see this headline from all the vendors want to sell us shiny boxes or want to, want to sell us, uh, you know, buy our tool or buy our solution or buy our service hmm. or buy our set of policies and you'll be GDPR compliant and you won't have to pay 20 million And, and you get a free set of steak knives as well. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, you've, you're you just going to outline there the other enforcement actions that can happen. I think that's very important that people realize it's this is not just about the fines. This is absolutely not just about the fines. And it's also not just about a negative sanction on the organization. So we'll talk about fines for a moment. Then I'm going to talk about the, the, the positive aspects of, of, of data privacy compliance and data privacy practices. Among the powers the Data Protection Commission will have is the power to tell you to stop doing the processing you're doing. 
the power to tell you not to transfer data overseas, the power to order you to make changes to the processing you're doing within a time period they define, not necessarily the time period you would want to do it in. And I worked in a phone company for a number of years, and I've, I've got the experience of the regulator saying, that's nice, you say that'll take three years, you've got 12 months. And that then changes your, your planning, it means you then have to invest more in a short period of time to, to fix problems. Now, these are, to an extent, powers the commissioner already has. One of the big changes in GDPR is a very subtle one. Currently, uh, offences under the current Data Protection Acts are offences against the commissioner. So the commissioner has to tell you to, to do something or to not do something today, uh, and then you have to ignore them for there to an offence to be committed. Under GDPR, it's an offence against the article. Not doing the thing, not complying with the principle, is in itself the offence. And the role of the commissioner is to identify what meaningful, dissuasive, and effective penalty will best suit that uh, particular scenario. And that could be a fine, or it could be telling you, stop doing that. And I think something that's really important that's often overlooked as well is the fact that there can be civil lawsuits. So Which people now have a right those, yeah. to actually, you know, sue for damages. And this is for material and non-material damages. Yeah, so that's I'm, like hurt feelings. Exactly. So like the current regulation in, under the Data Protection Act, you have to prove a direct connection and a direct loss Whereas uh, under GDPR, it, it can be just for I'm upset because my information was lost. Yeah. And then the last thing as well, and this is why a lot of people want to be compliant, and that's what's driving compliance for a lot of companies, is that you're responsible for your entire data supply chain. So that means if you're hiring vendors that are non-compliant, or if you are a vendor to somebody and you're non-compliant, you're going to lose the business. Because people will want to seek compliance from you. We're seeing that already with clients we're working yeah. with. Same um, data controllers are asking, so their, their data processors I to step up. I just spent an hour in a form for mm. one of our um, major clients. <laughs> yeah. data pro- and, and data processors we're working yeah. with are, are, are seeing it as well. Uh, one of our clients, they pull the plug on suppliers before Christmas. Yeah, two suppliers. If, you're, if you're a supplier outside the EU, you don't have to care about GDPR. That's the myth, mm, one of the myths out there. Isn't yeah, it? GDPR is an, an interesting, I, I, I think it's equivalent to the US Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and there's one section in it that gives it ex- incredible uh, cross-border uh, impact. If you were involved in the profiling of, of people who are physically located in the European Union, or if you're engaged in the act of targeting of products or services to people who are physically located in the European Union, it is not about citizenship, it is not about residency, it's about where are you standing at this point in time, then that organisation has to comply with uh, GDPR, with European Data Protection Principles. So that's the challenge for some of the large corporates. if you're an Irish company and you're using vendors outside of the EU, you need to... You need to do due diligence, you need to check through them. And again, that's currently the situation. Um, GDPR heightens the the requirements around that because, again, the sanctions for not doing it are going to be a lot higher. Now, the benefits to organizations who take data privacy seriously, and Cisco have released a research paper uh, back in February on this, um, you're looking at significantly shorter sales cycles if you've got good governance around privacy. The the trust dividend is quite high um, compared to organizations that aren't taking it seriously. So the benefits there, if you one of the things you have to do under GDPR, as Emerald said, documenting your core processing activities. If you've documented your sales process, you can make it more efficient and you can get money from customers faster. Who doesn't want to get money from customers faster? And there's also the fact that in the average organization, between 10 and 30% of your turnover is consumed with Poor quality data. The cost of correcting, rechecking, fact checking, cross checking data is a key hidden cost in organizations is accepted and it's way beyond the 4% of turnover penalties. Emerald, what one piece of advice would you give to people at the moment about GTPO? The first piece of advice would be educate yourself and check where what you're reading. Because everybody right now is a GDPR expert and there are so many myths and so yeah. many people talking about this Absolutely. that should not be talking about this. And the second step is if you don't have good privacy people in-house and you want to take this seriously, just hire them. Ex- take the hit now because you will take the hit later. It and is an event. Your, what's your parting tip? Parting tip. A friend of mine is, is a doctor and he and I are now sharing similar views on Dr. Google. Um, (laughs) self-diagnosis is not a diagnosis Um, stop look plan sit down if you do nothing else sit down with a blank sheet of paper and draw the flow of how information comes into your organization what's done with it and where it goes get an idea of the landscape and then identify where the risks are train your staff 
be very careful about the training you get. I, we, we do quality assurance review. We, we do training. We do QA reviews on training that clients are buying. I have seen some incredibly bad training and the advice. With one course we looked at, I, my, my comment was, I hope their insurance is good. I also spoke to Mark Kellett, CEO of Magnum Networks at the INM DataSec GDPR conference uh, in Dublin. And I asked him about the implementation of GDPR and Magnus' approach to the regulation. I suppose take it back to my formation and traineeship as, a, as a, an accountant. And I suppose in the world of finance, you get uh, drilled into you. two things to be a good accountant. Discipline, decision making and financial statement integrity. And really I look at GDPR along the same ways as data integrity and disciplined use of data. So very similar in terms of the thought processes. You know, in, in the finance world, you have controls, financial controls, you have internal audit. I look at the role of the DPO somewhat in a similar vein to the internal audit role. So it, was, it wasn't a, an alien thought to me, the GDPR. In fact, I saw it as actually just very good business practice. And from a magnet standpoint, as we've grown as a business, I look at GDPR as something we should and have adapted and adopted as a competitive um, enhancement. You know, customers, and I suppose the presumption has to be that you will suffer a breach or a hack. And that is the one thing we say to our customers. So starting from the premise that your business will be attacked, there will be a leak, there will be a breach, that's the safest place to start from. So in that context, as a, as a, as a formation, as a foundation stone, stone, we have, you know, the very first iteration of GDPR was understanding it, was looking at our own network security, looking at how we dealt with customer records, and from a company perspective, organizational perspective, appointing your internal auditor, in this case, the DPO. So we early on adopted a DPO, um, and uh, he's been busy working through training and looking at our processes, policies, procedures. Uh, so so that's really, from, from a foundation st- standpoint as Magnus, how have we reacted to it? It's no different to my reaction to Brexit. I look at it as a branch tree. It's an opportunity. How do you get into the UK as opposed to panicking out of the UK? GDPR is about how you get into and adopt it and use it as a competitive threat or competitive weapon for the advantage of the business. And that's where we are. Very interesting to hear that approach, Mark, because uh, I think, as you said, a lot of companies are looking at GDPR as this big beast that they they have to wrangle and wrestle to the ground and beat it. But you see more as a an advantage, as, a, as something that you can use to, to help boost business. Yeah, so in the last year, we have expanded outside Ireland and the UK. Actually, we've had a UK entity for the last five years. Uh, my own background has actually been at an international level, working for companies like Yahoo in the States, uh, network appliance in the tech storage industry, Sun Microsystems. So my career was built primarily outside of the Irish marketplace. And Magnus has grown to become not just an Irish. We used to talk about taking Irish business to the cloud, but now I talk about taking Irish business to the stars in that context because we use satellites now for some of our customers you know, GDPR, by the way, one of the challenges is how do you deal with not data transmitting between one country and another, but how do you deal with it going outside the atmosphere and back in again? <laughs> so we're kind of we're, we really are pushing the envelope and the, the, the boundaries of, of data processing. When how, do you, how does GDPR regulation deal with the processing of data on a satellite, you know, in a mid-earth orbit satellite at 35,000 miles up? So we're kind of really pushing the boundaries. So, so from an opportunity standpoint, we look at the international businesses where a lot of our growth is coming from. And in the context of international growth, we've recently opened an office in Sydney. We'll be opening an office in uh, Portland and likely to be opening an office in uh, in Singapore in due course. So our customers are becoming increasingly global in their outlook, whether they be Irish brands who are looking to grow and export uh, or whether they're US brands who have located here but need fantastic excellence and execution around customer engagement. So we have to stand out from the crowd. I mean, the vision I use for Magnet is to be the best B2B telecoms company in the world, right? known for excellence and innovation, execution and customer engagement. That doesn't mean we're the biggest. That's not the ambition isn't to be the biggest, it's to be the best. And we're not saying we are. So that's what's striving, it's an ambition, right? So the vision is that, and in order to achieve that, and particularly t- to win on customer engagement, customers have to trust us. And so you presume, you know, on the basis that people will try and attack us, they'll try and hack us, they'll try and breach us, social engineering, we see it all the time, then how do we, uh, you know, adapt our processes, policies to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect our customers' data, to stand out from the competition as a small 
Irish telecoms business operating on a global stage. You have to be excellent in terms of your deployment of GDPR and data protection as a fundamental principle. Back to my point about financial statement integrity, you know, discipline, decision making and data integrity. So do you find any difficulties or probably that's probably too strong a word mark, but challenges with your international clients, you know, the coming from the US or from other jurisdictions who may not have a similar approach or respect for personal data as we do here in Europe and do you see what Magnet offer kind of being a a gold standard for privacy that the rest of the world can follow? So is GDPR something that not only you see being advantage for your European clients, but maybe for your, your, your international clients as well? So in that context, is Magnet, I suppose, again, striving to be and achieve a gold or platinum standard? Um, it starts with our own core DNA and changes we've had to make. So in that context, how I even I operate as a CEO on my team when we're traveling, you know, what is that gold standard? Um, and I'm looking at the GDPR regulations, or just, just good practice in data, data security is the min-max principle. You know, the minimum amount of data to provide the maximum amount of output in terms of decision making. So in that context, you know, I travel with the lightest amount of data possible. Um, I've deleted some of the, the desktop icons for, for Outlook and others so that I don't access natively on the desktop or my Surface Pro, whatever it might be, webmail or my, my email. I use web applications to access that. But it's like everything else, a good corporate governance and good balance sheet practice. You know, there are authority matrices, there's approvals for good reason to maintain integrity of your balance sheet. So with that discipline of balance sheet integrity, you have to have that same mindset of data integrity. And we're finding that we're helping to educate some of our customers. So there is this philosophy or mindset of raise the bridge, lower the water. How do you help customers improve their revenue line and reduce their cost base? Well, one cost is, you know, around failure for data. Data security can result in significant fines. But if you're setting yourself out there and have good, robust, compliant data policies, you may end up winning business over your competitors. So we have found ourselves in multi-jurisdictions talking to our customers about and advising them about what we do even down to the culture of, you know, as I said, removing icons from my desktop when I'm traveling, how I access certain things, what type of data I take with me, um, which most people don't think about. I and mean, the audience at the event today, I'm sure half of them, you know, we know that over half of people still, Irish people, still open emails from people they don't know. You know, I think that's just crazy. So there's still a long way to go in best practice at a company level. So despite all the software, all the best policies, it is down to the human aspect of it. And uh, that's what we try and, you know, reinforce with the customers uh, in that context. That's all we have time for on this episode of the Know Your GDPR podcast series. And my thanks to Dara and Emerald for joining me on the show. Also, my thanks to Mark Kellett of Magnet Networks. On the next episode, we'll be finding out the practical steps that every business owner needs to be taking to make sure you're GDPR compliant. So stay tuned for that show. I'm Brian Honan, and thanks for listening. Know your GDPR with independent.ie. Powered by Magnet Networks. Powered by Magnet Networks. Powered by Magnet Networks. Powered.